in the series of the little-known big men of the Word of God. You would have to place Caleb, for Caleb must be on any roster. That includes the little-known big men of the Word of God. I put him on a par with Joshua. And as I said the other Sunday, when we were speaking about Joshua, God took an ordinary man and used him. And Joshua is an example of what God can do with an ordinary man. Candidly, I would not only put this man, Caleb, on a par with Joshua, I would consider him actually a greater leader than Joshua was. But in the choice of Joshua, you see the sovereign grace of God in operation. And God never asked me, and he never asked you, and he never asked anyone. And today he moves in his same sovereign purpose through this world. And it's not for you and me to question, but it's for you and me to accept and to bow to his will. Now, some of God's choicest saints have received scant attention on the pages of Scripture. And this man, Caleb, this morning, and I'd like for us to look at what the Word of God says concerning him. His name means several things, and that's interested me a great deal. His name, some think, means dog. Well, I don't like that, and I personally do not think that that is really the word. But a great many very fine scholars feel that that's the meaning of Caleb. If that's true, there's one thing you can say about him. He was a bloodhound that for 40 years stayed right on the trail of the will of God, never got out of it. There is another meaning. It means crow. And you certainly can't call him old crow because he tells us he never grew old. He's the man who found the fountain of youth. His name also means basket, and certainly he was a basket of the fruits of the Spirit. His name also means courageous or bold, and I like that much better. I think that is the thing that sets him before us on the pages of Scripture. He was a man of courage, to be sure. And the reason that he was a man of courage was because he was a man of faith primarily. Now, I know that someone will say, well, when you go to the 11th chapter of Hebrews and you read the list of the heroes of faith, Caleb is not mentioned. Well, Caleb's not mentioned at all in the New Testament. He's absolutely omitted. But I believe there's a reason that his name's omitted in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. The writer tells us very cogently why he left out certain ones. He says, for the time would fail me. He said, I can't go back into the Old Testament and give you the entire catalog of the heroes of faith. God keeps that up yonder. And I know one thing, that Caleb's name is on God's heroes of faith. He was that. He was a man of faith. And we find here in verse 11, and if I had a text, this would have to be it, but I don't have a text, so this is not it. But will you listen to verse 11? As yet, it's Caleb speaking, as yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then. Even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Now, this man somehow or another found the fountain of youth. After 40 years in the wilderness, this man could say, and that was quite an experience, by the way, he and Joshua were the only ones that made it through the wilderness. And he could say, I'm as strong this day as I was Forty years ago, when I came into this land to spy it out. Not many men can say that, but this man could say that. He was a man of faith. Ponce de Leon came with Columbus on his second journey to the Western Hemisphere, and 
Ponce de Leon was looking for the fountain of youth. And he looked all over Florida and didn't find it. And, of course, we understand why. If he'd come to California, he would have found it. He was looking in the wrong state. But nevertheless, this man, Ponce de Leon, had to confess he hadn't found it. La Salle went across the country looking for the same thing, and he found the upper Mississippi. And instead of finding the fountain of youth, he found Old Man River. Certainly, these men did not find the fountain of youth. But here is a man who did. Caleb could say, after 40 years, and he was 40 years when he left the land of Egypt, this man had been a slave. That was rigorous. He'd spent 40 years in the wilderness. That was even more so. And now the man says, I'm as young as I was as a young man, 40 years of age. What had happened? Well, he found the fountain of youth. And this morning, I'd like for us briefly to search out Caleb's secret as he searched out the land 40 years before. And today, I want you to look at three things concerning this man. First, he had faith to forget the past. And second, he had faith to face the facts of the present. And third, he had faith to face the future. These are three wonderful qualities for any person to have. And I do not this morning guarantee they'll make you young. But I do say this. Whether you are young or old and whether you live to a ripe old age or die in youth, it will contribute to a happy, joyful Christian life and a fruitful Christian life, if you please. Now, first of all, let's note faith to forget the past. And I want to turn back to the book of Numbers. You will recall that's when we were first introduced to this man. Back in the book of Numbers, we were told that he was one of the spies who went in. And in the 13th chapter, at verse 30, you see his report. He and Joshua brought back the minority report. They spied out the land, and they came back, and all of the spies, when they were dealing with the facts, gave the same report. They said that it was a land that was flowing with milk and honey, that it was a land that was a delightful place, that it was a land of fruits and grain, and it was everything that God had said it was. And they didn't need to spy it out. They could have taken God's word for it. And they made their tragic mistake, the children of Israel, to even go spy out the land. They should not have done that. Because when they got back, they had no new information. They were even told by the Lord about the giants. And when these spies saw the giants, they were frightened. And when you get the interpretation of the facts, that's when the report differs and you find a minority report. The majority report said, let's not go in. We can't take the land. And humanly speaking, they could not take the land. But this man Caleb, and I want you to listen to him, for up to this point there has been no leader except Moses. And my reason for believing that Caleb was an outstanding man, he was the one that stepped forward and not Joshua here at the beginning. I'm looking at Numbers 13:30, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And, of course, that was true. But Caleb was a man of faith, if you please, and he knew God had promised to give them the land, 
This man, Caleb, was ready to go in. He had faith to go in and take the land. Now you will find out that Israel at this time forgot all about the promised land and turned their thoughts back to Egypt. And we read in the 14th chapters of Numbers, verse 4, they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return unto Egypt. The children of Israel wanted to go back to Egypt. They said those brickyards weren't near as bad as we thought they were. The taskmaster lash upon our backs. we have forgotten about it. It wasn't as severe as we thought it was. We want to go back. But Caleb, he had faith to forget the past. He had faith to forget Egypt. He had faith to turn his back upon that which was in the past. Now will you notice, that's the thing that is said. Verse 6. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. They spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. You want that in good old Americana? He said, they're duck soup for us. We won't have any difficulty taking that land for the very simple reason. God has promised it to us, and we can lay hold of it, because God has promised to give it to us. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for their bread for us, their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Now, Caleb had broken all ties with Egypt. He had now turned his back on the past. Our Lord made this statement. He says, if a man puts his hand to the plow and looks back, it's a dangerous thing to put your hand to the plow and look back. I say to you today, especially Christian friend, if God has led you to make a certain decision, and you've made that decision, and you started following along, especially if you're a young person, and you come to a place where you're seeing giants now, and you feel like maybe you ought not to go ahead, you're timid. May I say to you this morning, oh, to have faith to forget the past, Break with that. Don't go back to where you were. Keep pressing on. May I say to you, we need today, when we put our hand to the plow, we need to keep going and not look back. Our Lord said to this man, yonder by the pool, he said, take up your bed, walk. And the old Puritan commentator remarking on this, he said what he really meant was, make no arrangement for a relapse. There are a great many Christians today that they start out and they made all their plans for a return trip. fact of the matter is they have bought a return ticket. They did not buy a one-way ticket in the will of God. I tell you, you and I need to forget the past. You and I need to put it back of us today. Paul could say this. This one thing I do. Oh, we need to sharpen down our lives today. And the reason so many of us are frustrated today, we haven't got our lives sharpened down to that one thing. This one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind. Memory is a wonderful thing. It gives you roses in December. But do you know that forgetting is equally a wonderful quality, an ability to forget? I hear people even today say, oh, if we could only go back to the good old days. 
The Lord deliver us. I don't know about you, but I don't remember any good old days in the past. You mean you want to take me back to the day I entered the ministry in the Depression? Mm Mm-mm. I want to forget that. You want to take me back to the past? No, my friend, may I say that we today need to forget the things that are in the past. It's wonderful to have a memory. It's also wonderful to have a good forgettery. Let's not go back to the good old days of the past. Let's go on. How many folk today are handicapped because of the memory of a background that is black? They have been overcome and are overwhelmed today by some experience that they've had, some failure of the past, and they are hindered and thwarted and convicted and defeated today because of the memory of something that's in the background. How many believers today are tortured by a troubled conscience? How many today are saying, oh, it might have been, and if it had only been another way and not like it is? How many are stung by a frightful reminder today and there looms up out of the past something that stares you in the face, straps us and handcuffs us And we toss on our bed at night and say, if we could only push this aside. A man came in to see me several months ago. And he said, Dr. McGee, I'm an ex-convict. I've been working down at a certain place now for nearly a year. He said they just happened to notice on my application that I'd been in prison. Took them a year to notice it. And he says, for no other reason, they called me in and let me go. Well, I said, the thing that you must do is to forget your past. He says, I'm willing to forget it, but others are not. That man has had more difficulty here in Los Angeles at getting a job because, well, the world won't forget it, that's for sure. But he should forget it. When I was pastor in Cleburne, Texas, a man drove up in front of my home, a man who attended the church. He was not a member. He said, I want you to know that I am a Christian. I have not joined the church. I have not made an open confession of my faith in Christ. And the reason is that when I came to this country years ago, a young man, I killed another young man. And he says, you know, that's always stood in my way. I have never done anything for God. Well, I said, regardless of what it is in the past, he said, I had to kill him. Because either he would kill me or I'd kill him. He said, maybe I should not have. I have wished many times I'd let him kill me. Well, I said, regardless of the past, you can't go back and do a thing about it. The thing for you to do if you have taken Christ as your Savior is to forget it. Because God forgets our past. This is the thing that he says this morning to you. And if you are here today bothered by a past, he says, I will remember their sins no more. When God says that he will forget your sins, my friend, don't you start bringing them up. He's forgotten them. And when God forgets, you can be sure of one thing, it's forgotten. He says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he put our sins from us, he's put them in the bottom of the ocean. Now, don't dredge them up. Have you come to Christ? Have you accepted him as your Savior? Forget the past. I want to turn to a statement Paul made in Colossians. Listen to this, verse 14 of the second chapter. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Regardless of what your path might be today, 
regardless of failure, that has been nailed to the cross, my beloved. And God is forgotten. There used to be a man in the Middle West that would get up in a testimony meeting and he would constantly say, Oh, my old black heart. And it got so that a lot of the more facetious members of the church, when they'd meet him on the seat, would say, Well, how's your old black heart today? May I say to you, friends, if you've got an old black heart and you've come to Christ as Savior, let's quit talking about the old black heart. He's forgiven you. The old account was settled long ago. In my Southland, there was a Negro woman who had a radiant Christian testimony, joyful all the time. And someone asked her one day, what is the secret of the joy in your life? She says, it's very simple. She says, when I work, I work hard. When I rest, I set loose. When I worry, I go to sleep. The trouble with us is that when we worry, we don't go to sleep. All oh, today, this man, Caleb, forgot Egypt. He had no notion of going back. He had no notion of bringing back the days of Egypt. He's going on. My friend, if God has forgiven you today your sins, they're in the past. Move on. Now we come to faith, to face the facts of the present. Here in the first chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, we had another statement concerning this man, Caleb. Let me read two verses here. Verses 34 and 35 in the first chapter of Deuteronomy. And the Lord heard the voice of your words, and he was wroth, and a swear, saying, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which I swear to give unto their fathers. Save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it, and to him will I give the land that he hath trodden upon, and to his children because he hath wholly followed the Lord. The world today is looking for a way to escape from the facts of life. They are today forging some escape mechanism. Multitudes have made themselves air raid shelters here in Southern California, and you can buy homes today in certain tracts, and they will provide an air raid shelter. Oh, what a flight there is today from reality. A great many are traveling today by tranquilizers. They say the pace today is too fast. Literally this morning, thousands of people in Southern California will climb upon a bar stool and have a cocktail. You know why? They are trying to get away from the realities of life. They have not faith to face the facts of life at all. They want to escape from all of it. And you find today that this world, we speak of it being a matter-of-fact materialistic world. I do not agree with that. I think that this world today around us is playing hide-and-seek with facts. They won't face up to them. I was rather amused reading in a magazine, holiday magazine, an advertisement for Southern California put in there by the Chamber of Commerce. Do you think they face up to the facts? You would think we had never had smog out here and that we had no traffic problem whatsoever. They won't face up to the facts. So many people today say, let's not look at the facts. There is a new philosophy. It's not new, it's old. They call it new thought today. If you just rearrange your thinking, well, my friend, you can rearrange your thinking like chess men on a chessboard, but that won't change the facts of life. And some today in this fair land can't even face up to the facts. And they take the awful way out the route of suicide, and it won't be long now till we're going to be ahead of San Francisco. We've topped them on everything else, 
I don't see why we shouldn't top them on suicides. Won't be long now, because we're stepping right up upon them. Many today can't face the facts of life, and they take that way out today. Years ago, again, if you will pardon me for returning to my Southland, there was a woman, head of a home, and she was complaining about everything and finding fault and saying, oh, if I could just get away from it all. She had a Negro maid, and this Negro maid said to her, said, listen, what are you trying to get away from? This lovely home, these beautiful children, a fine husband. What is it that you're trying to get away from? No matter where you go, you're going to have to lug yourself along. Oh, today a great many people say, if I could just escape, my friend, you can't escape. You have to take yourself along wherever you go. Israel did not believe God. God turned them back into that wilderness for 38 years. And they spent that entire time murmuring. And all you have during that period is a book that is filled with tears and sorrow. It's a pen of pain, a poem of pity, a proverb of pathos, a hymn of heartbreak, a psalm of sadness, a symphony of sorrow, a story of sifting, a tale of tears, a dirge of desolation, a tragedy of travail, an account of agony. And it was a book of boo-hoo, where they boo-hooed all the way through the wilderness. They complained and murmured about everything. They were not willing to face up to their own failures. They were not willing to face up to the fact they were not going by faith with God. But Caleb, Caleb knew that desert was hot. And my friend, that desert was just as real to him as it was to any Israelite. But he was walking with God. Have you ever noticed the place that he saw when he was in that land? Kurdish Sefa was the name of the place. City of Books. But he was no bookworm. He changed his name. He called that city Hebron. <laughs> he called it that long before it was his. When he got back and he says, Moses, I've seen the most beautiful spot in that land. The name of it is Hebron for me. What does Hebron mean? Communion. <laughs> Communion. For 40 years, while the children of Israel was saying, oh, if we could only go back to Egypt. He said, wait till the day I get to Hebron. Communion with God. And for 40 years, he communed with God. Wonderful to get to that place. Paul went on, he says, not only forgetting those things which are behind, but he says, I've learned that in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And I'll be honest with you, this morning I wish I could learn that. I remember a missing a plane in Houston, Texas, and I don't like to fly anyway, and the next plane out, by that time, a storm had come up. Boy, was I whining. A friend of mine who came out to have a little fellowship, and we had dinner together, I just cried on one of his shoulders, and then when I got it damp, I went over and cried on his other shoulder. I told him how terrible it was. He reminded me of that verse of Scripture, and I must confess it was very meaningless at the time. I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Have you learned it? Caleb, how do you like the wilderness? Don't like it. Well, you seem to be rejoicing and the rest of them are murmuring. What's the difference? Just been thinking about Hebron today. And I'm contented. 
because I know that in God's own time, I'll be there. And I'm having communion with him. Children of Israel weren't having communion with him. I can assure you they weren't. And that crabby Christian today is not having communion. He may be having something else, but he's not having communion. This man, Caleb, what a joy it was to have seen him in the camp of Israel. Some brother meets him and says, Brother Caleb, it's hot today, isn't it? He says, it sure is. 115 down at Palm Springs, I understand. But he said, you know, up in Hebron, it's delightful. And that's where I've been all day. You don't mean to tell me you've been sneaking into the promised land? He says, yes, I sneak in at every opportunity I get. I have communion with him. And there were a lot of places in that wilderness that this man could have called Hebron communion, where he'd had communion with God. May I come briefly to the last? He had faith to face the future. I turn back to this 14th chapter of the book of Joshua, and will you listen as I read verses 10 and 11? And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years. Even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old, as yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now, for war both to go out and to come in. This man Caleb was not timid about claiming his possession. He went to Joshua immediately and he said, Look, Joshua, we're in the land for 40 years. I've been looking forward to this. I want you now to give to me Hebron. Moses promised it to me. God said I could have Hebron and I'm claiming Hebron. How many of us today blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies? We can just go on about that. We know all about Ephesians. But how many of us have gone and taken Hebron today? We're having communion with God. While for 40 years this man lived in high anticipation and now he says, I want it. That which had killed others, it had no effect on him. For everyone in the generation that left Egypt, except Joshua and Caleb, died in the wilderness. What was a tombstone to them became a stepping stone for him. They grew old. He grew young. And the interesting thing is, after 40 years, the giants are still in the land, and the giants, the Anakim, still hold Hebron. Others tremble. They said, wouldn't you be willing to settle for a lesser place? And this man Caleb said, no, I'll not settle for a lesser place. Yeah, but there are giants in Hebron. He says, I know all about them. I saw them 40 years ago, and they're not any bigger today than they were then. God would have given them to me 40 years ago, and he'll give them to me today. Message we brought on the subject, giants, grasshoppers, and God. Others went in there, they said, they're giants. We see ourselves as grasshoppers. But the interesting thing is, they didn't see God, and that's what Caleb saw. He saw the giants. He said they were there. And do you know what happened? He took the land, and we are told here in the 15th chapter, will you notice verse 14, and Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, Shishai, Ahiman, and Talmai, the children of Anak. He drove the whole family out of Hebron, a bunch of giants. I said at the beginning that Caleb is not in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. I made a mistake. He is. 
We read in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down when they were compassed about seven days. By faith. Whose faith? Joshua, for one, we saw that. I have another one, Caleb. I do not know about the rest of the children of Israel, but I do know about Caleb. Caleb had faith, and the walls of Jericho fell down. He's in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. And he says, now let me get to these giants. When's the last time you killed a giant? My Christian friend this morning, we are all running for midgets today. Many of us as Christians are running for midgets. Caleb killed giants. Paul said, not only forgetting the things which are behind, but reaching forth unto the things which are before. I press to the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This is the man that said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Nothing in myself, Paul says, I know that within me, within my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. The old nature completely bad. To will is present with me, but how to perform it I find not. There's no power in the new nature either. Paul found both of those things to be true. But Paul found out that Christ was a giant killer. He found out that if you're going to lay hold of spiritual possessions, that you've got an enemy and that enemy is a giant. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to overcome the wiles of the devil. You and I are no match for him today. He can whip you and whip me in a second. But thank God greater is he that's in you than the one that's in the world. My Christian friend today, why not be like Caleb? I do not say you're going to live a long life. I only say that you can move in and lay hold of spiritual possessions that will bring joy to your life. And then now I close. Maybe you are here today and you're not a Christian. You may even be just a church member. You have never found the fountain of eternal life. May I say to you today, there is one who, he himself, is the water of life. And he says, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Are you thirsty today? That's the only condition. Are you satisfied this morning? Or is there a great vacuum and void inside the day? And you said, oh, if I could only drink of the fountain of the water of life. He says, if you thirst, come and drink. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. You say you haven't any money. They're the ones he's inviting, those without money and price. I have no goodness. He knows that. That's the reason he died for you. You say today I have no character. He knows that. He provides all of that for you. If you think you've got anything... Don't come, you're not thirsty. But if you're thirsty, come, eat and satisfy.